Good morning. <clears throat> my uh, New Year's resolution is to start on time. I'm five minutes late today, so my apologies. Uh, I want to welcome you to Christ Community Church. My name is Stephen Watson. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. We're glad the rest of you are here too. Uh, but if you're here with your first time, you should have received a welcome card either when you came through the door or there's some in the seats in front of you. We would love it if you would fill one of those out. And in the very back corner, uh, we have a black box. That's our offering box. If you could just drop that in there. Uh, what we'll do with that, we'll send you an email explaining who we are and what we're about. And right now, we, we haven't got back into the habit of like making Sunday bulletins. So we email out those bulletins of upcoming events. Um, one other thing, we are in a new facility, so we're still learning it. Uh, so bathrooms, if you go out those doors, it's to your left. There's a baby changing table in the last bathroom. Also, one of the things that we found is that having a concrete floor um, makes a little bit more of a mess if we spill our coffee or whatever. Um, so we've also found that the paper towels in the bathroom don't soak it up good. So what we've done is we set a basket behind the offering box back there. There's a basket back there with real towels. So if you spill something, you drop something, we don't care. It happens. It's life. Uh, but go grab one of those towels and soak it up. It'll, it'll, it'll do the job better. And then at the end of service, you don't even have to do it during service. At the end of service, just kind of throw it back there in the corner and uh, we'll pick it up and wash it and put it back. Uh, a couple other things that are coming up. Uh, one of those things is next Sunday, we have a next step meeting. After the second service, we'll gather in what we call the fellowship hall. It used to be a garage in the old house that's been converted. Uh, we're going to have lunch and we're going to talk about who we are as a church, what we value as a church, and just get to know each other some. Uh, if you want to become a member, it's the next step in becoming a member. If you're still curious and just want to learn, learn more about the church and meet the staff and kind of hear what our heartbeat is, it's a great time to get to know the church as well. On the 15th, oh, I'm sorry, if you want to go to that to make sure we have enough food, you can RSVP office at Christ.community or you can just talk to me personally and I'll, I'll email myself so I don't forget. Uh, one of the things we don't do RSVPs for is men's breakfast because we know you won't. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we do buy enough food to make sure everyone has food, but come to that men's breakfast. It's on January 15th. We'll meet up here at the church house uh, to be in God's word and to challenge one another to live out our faith uh, in our daily life. Uh, that'll be from 7.30 till we're done. I think 9 or 9.30. I can't remember. Also coming up, uh, well, not coming up, but we do believe that giving is a part of worship. You can either do that online or through the mail, or we have the offering box in the back. Uh, do, that, do that at your leisure, but we do believe that is a part of worship and what it means to follow after God. Now, we also, being New Year, we have Bible reading plans in the back of the sanctuary on the table. So if you are at a point in your life where it's like, well, I finished my Bible reading plan, or I stopped my Bible reading plan last February, and I'm ready to start a new one back up, we have a couple different options in the back for you. One is reading the Bible through an entire year. The other one is reading the New Testament through an entire year. Uh, so both are good options. Bible reading plans shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't be a burden on you. They are tools to help you engage in God's word. So we encourage you to approach them in that way. But make, I think the important thing is that we're engaging God's word and that we're also meditating and thinking about the things that we're reading. Uh, but there are a couple options on the back table. Uh, or uh, Version Bible app has so many Bible reading plans. It can be overwhelming sometimes about how many there are. But I encourage you to look there as well. Christ Community Church, let's go ahead and stand for our call to worship. For this new year, our first call to worship is Psalm 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his namesake. Christ Community Church, let's lift our voices to our God, who is our great provider. Sing in tenderness. 
tenderness he sought me weary and sick with sin and on his shoulders brought me back to his fold again while angels in his presence sing until the courts of heaven ring oh, 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 oh the love that sought me oh, 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 oh the blood that bought me oh the grace that brought me to the fold of god grace that brought me to the fold of god He died for me while I was sinning, needy and poor and blind. He whispered to assure me, I found you, you are mine. I never heard a sweeter voice. It made my aching heart rejoice. Oh, 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 the love that sought me. Oh, 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 the blood that bought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God. Grace that brought me to the fold of God. Oh, whoa. Upon his grace I'll daily ponder and sing anew his praise. With all adoring wonder, his blessings I'll retrace. It seems as if eternal days are far too short to sing his praise. Oh, oh, oh the love that sought me. Oh, 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 the blood that bought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God. Grace that brought me to the fold of God. Oh, me oh, oh, oh the blood that bought me oh the grace that brought me to the fold of god grace that brought me to the fold of god How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my guilt upon his shoulders. 
ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. boast in anything. No gifts, no paths, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom, why should I gain from his reward, I cannot give an answer, but this I know His wounds have paid my ransom. Yes, this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Thinking about all the things we want to get done with the next year, but I want to take this back a second. And I want you to look back the other direction and think about the things you've already been through. Not just this past year, not just the past five years, not since you've just been here, if you're military and just moved here, but for the entirety of your life. A lot of us have accumulated debt coming out of the holidays for things like Christmas presents and other things like that, right? And we're going to be looking forward to maybe making that one of our resolutions going forward of trying to pay off that debt. But there's one thing that we all have in common, whether we have things we've done in the past that we have regrets about, or debts about, or happiness about, is that we all have one debt that we can't pay back. In Romans 6.23, we're told that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't want to, you to think about these things and be saddened about it or disheartened or hopeless about the things you've already accumulated in your past from these wages that we've earned so truthfully based on God's standard for the works we've done. But I also don't want you to keep striving to go forward and trying to pay off those debts yourself. In 1 Timothy, we're told that this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save our sinners to save us sinners. That means he specifically came and has already paid that debt that we've earned over these past years or however many years you've been working hard at earning that wage. I want you to close your eyes with me and pray for a few minutes and just pray thankful for the paycheck that he's given us in his stead, not the one we've earned ourselves and let those things go for this next year. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for not requiring me to pay back the debt that I have so easily accumulated and so previously spent, Lord, and that you're willing to come down for us and pay that debt on our behalf so that we can work towards glorifying you and not towards forever paying a debt we cannot ever hope to accomplish. Thank you for this day, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Now, as we move into this time of communion, I want you to know that you don't have to be a member of Christ Community Church to practice this with us. This is just a symbolic thing for something else to help us remember what Christ has already done for us and what he's going to come back and remind us again in the future. That being said, if you're not a believer who's walking in faith right now or you have some unrepentant sin or some burdens or debts you're still not willing to let somebody else pay for, I would ask you not to observe this with us and just let pass by the communion elements. And we're happy to pray with you after the fact or after the service. Just come let myself or Pastor Stephen know. Um, but that being said, you don't have to be a member of our church, and we invite you to enjoy and partake in this meal with us. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he took the twelve into the upper room, and after giving thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, broken for you. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup represents the new covenant shed for you in my blood. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. But Paul goes on to tell us, not only are we doing this in remembrance of him, we're doing this in expectation of him coming back again for us in the future, and we should look forward to his coming every time we partake of this. while they're preparing themselves. Since we are in a new facility, we're gonna go row by row. You'll exit towards the wall, on the outside walls, you'll come forward to receive communion. You'll return to your seat back in the middle. If you are going to Children's Church, which is kindergarten through fourth grade, and you've checked in, you can go ahead and meet in the back of the sanctuary. Your teachers will meet you there, and they will be uh, ready for your parents at the end of the service. Good morning. Our scripture today is from Luke 13, verses 1 to 9. At that time, some people came and reported to him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And he responded to them, Do you think that these Galileans were more sinful than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. 
or those 18 that the tower in Siloam fell on and killed, do you think they were more sinful than all the other people who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He told the vineyard worker, listen, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it even waste the soil? But he replied to him, sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Perhaps it will produce food, fruit next year, but if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Rhonda. We were joking last week how we had just finished the Advent season, ending with a culmination of talking about peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then last Sunday, we read Jesus' words in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, where Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace, but division. And then we had the New Year's, and everyone's all excited for the New Year, and I opened up the text again, and the theme is repent or perish. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a heavy topic today as we are continuing our discussion about the judgment of God. As I was reading this passage this week, I couldn't help but think about a super bloom. You ever heard of a super bloom? They had one in California just a few years back after fire ravaged the countryside and it burnt down forests and valleys and and, uh, devastated the land. After the next rain, the fields were transformed. They looked like this. Um, After... A fire destroys the vegetation. What happens is all the nutrients from those plants fall into the ground. All the seeds that were in their pods are released into the ground. And then with the sun and the rain, it transforms that barren wasteland that's been burnt over into these colorful fields. And I believe this one was in California from the picture I found. But as you Google super bloom and you look at the images, it's it's absolutely fascinating and beautiful. As I was reading this passage and I was thinking about the judgment of God, and oftentimes when we think about the judgment of God, oftentimes we do think about the weightiness uh, and the dread of that moment when when everybody will stand before the judgment seat of God to be judged according to what they have done. But I think there is another way of looking at the judgment of God, much like a super bloom. That in the judgment of God, the curse of the world will be destroyed. That evil will be removed from the world. And that every wrong will be made right. And what we will have after the judgment of God is a super bloom of the new creation. That's why in chapter 12, verse 48... When Jesus says this, he says, I came to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already set ablaze. Why is Jesus looking forward to that judgment? Well, he knows that after the judgment, the kingdom will flourish into this beautiful world that we live in uh, without sin, without the curse. So we want to continue to talk about the idea of God's judgment today in Luke chapter 13 verses 1 through 9 and we want to answer three questions that that we can ask from our text. We want to ask the question when will we be judged? Who will be judged? And what is the character and the nature of our judge? So first who will be judged? Let's look again at verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5 it says at that time at that time when Jesus was talking about judgment At that time, some people came and reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. We don't know what event that they're talking about historically, but we can gather what happened from what is said here. Pilate, the Roman governor of the area, 
apparently killed some Galileans as they were preparing to make their sacrifices. And the blood of their sacrifices that they were making to God was mixed with their own lifeblood as they were killed at the altar. So it's quite a gruesome scene that they brought up. This is how Jesus responded in verse 2. And he responded to them, Do you think that these Galileans were more sinful than all other Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Or those 18 that the tower in Siloam fell on and killed, do you think that they were more sinful than all the people who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you all will perish as well. What Jesus is doing here is he is talking about the moment of judgment. When Jesus was talking about the coming judgment at the end of chapter 12, it was at that time that people came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, are these people facing the judgment of God? These people who died at the altar with their sacrifices, was that because their judgment? Was it because of their sin that they died at the altar with their sacrifice? And I think it's a question that oftentimes we ask whenever we, say, when we face suffering in our lives, when we face trial in our lives, when we look at the darkness of the world and that darkness tends to creep into our own lives. Sometimes the question we ask is the same. Am I going through this trial at this moment because of God's judgment in my life? And I think there are three things that we need to remember as these people bring this issue up to Jesus and Jesus' response. I think the first thing we need to remember is that Jesus didn't answer their question the way that, he, that they wanted him to. Jesus didn't then talk about the politics of the day. He did not talk about about anything but repentance. So he doesn't quite give the answer to why these people suffered. And we see this true in other parts of the Bible, that oftentimes when we face suffering in our life, that God doesn't give us an explanation of that suffering. We think about the person of Job. Job, a righteous man in the Old Testament, uh, rich but also righteous, went through a great trial in his life. He went through a trial where he lost all of his uh, riches. He lost the lives of his children in a natural disaster. His house burns down around him. His wife tells him to curse God and die and his friends then betray him. Job went through a trial. And when Job then began to question God, God's answer was simple. Job, you're, you're not big enough to understand this. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I have done? Were you there when I raised the mountains? Were you there when I filled the storehouses with snow? And he was reminding Job how small he was and how big God was. We will not always know why we are going through trials. But what scripture does is it does point us to trust in God during those trials. You have an option when you go through trials. You can either say God is in control or you can say God is out of control. One of those answers is extreme comfort and one of those answers will bring extreme fear. The Bible teaches us that God is in control of all things, that he is sovereign, that he is good. And for those who love God, he works out all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his promises. So we will never always know why we suffer through things. I think the second thing we need to remember is that the curse of this world is real and active and bad things are going to happen as a result of the curse in the world. Once again, this is when we need to give thanks to God for his sovereignty. And I think about the story of a blind man. <clears throat> a, man was, a man was born blind in Luke chapter 18. And, and the people bring this blind man to Jesus and say, Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sin or was it because of the sin of his parents? They said, Jesus, here are your options. 
He was either born blind and bad things happened to him because of his own actions, or he was born blind because of the sinful actions of his parents. Which is it? And Jesus, being very Jesus, said it's neither one of them. He was born blind. And God will be glorified through his blindness. And what did Jesus then do? But he gave the man his sight back. Sometimes bad things are going to happen in the world, not because of your own sin, and maybe not even because of the sins of those around you, but bad things will happen because the world is cursed because of sin. And that needs us, we need to realize that when those bad things happen, that's not necessarily God's judgment on us or God's displeasure with us, but God working in our lives. I think there's a third thing that we need to remember when bad things do happen to us in our lives. We need to realize, one, that the curse is real and active, and sometimes bad things will happen because of that. We need to remember that God is in control of all things, but we also need to remember that sometimes bad things happen to us in our lives as a consequence of our sin. That when we sin, sometimes there are natural consequences to that sin that will cause more suffering in our life. Now we need to realize that when Jesus is talking about these Galileans who are killed, Jesus is essentially saying, this isn't their final judgment. And we need to realize that when we sin in our life and bad things happen as a result of our sin, that's not God's final judgment. In fact, if you're a believer, rather than viewing that as God's judgment, we need to view that as God's discipline. And that God is disciplining us through those consequences to bring us back to himself. To see the darkness and the corruption of that sin so that we would come back to him, turn to him, and walk in his ways. Bad things are going to happen to us on the earth, but that doesn't mean that that is God's final judgment. But scripture teaches us that the final judgment happens at the end of time. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that for all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In the book of Revelation chapter 20, John the apostle describes what happened with Satan being bound and Christ sitting on his throne judging the world. That this happens not in the midst of our lives but at the return of Christ. We need to make sure that when we look at what's happening in this world, we don't say that this is God's final judgment. That is to come later on. Now, this text also talks about who will be judged. Not only when will judgment come, but it talks about who will be judged. And we see that in these same first five verses. These people brought this issue of the Galileans being sacrificed Uh, or being killed along with their sacrifices, Jesus brings up this other current event. This current event where people were building on the wall of Jerusalem in Siloam, this tower. And in the midst of them building this tower, it collapses on them and 18 people pass away. In both instances, Jesus asked this question. He says, were the people in Galilee who were sacrificed with their sins, were they more sinful Than all the other Galileans. And Jesus answers his own question. He says, no, they're all sinful. They're all corrupt. They have all broken the law of God. And they said, these people in Jerusalem at the Tower of Siloam, whenever it fell and it crushed 18 people, were those 18 people more corrupt and more sinful than all the other people in Jerusalem? His answer again was no, they weren't more sinful than all the other people in Jerusalem. What Jesus is getting at is a truth that we pray during our prayer of confession, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that all people on earth will face his judgment. And so in the midst of making that point, what does Jesus tell us to do? Because he tells us how we ought to respond to that truth that all people will face judgment. And he tells us what to do. He says what we need to do is we need to repent. Repentance has always been a part of the Christian message. 
On the day of Pentecost when Peter was preaching his first sermon in Jerusalem and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says that the people heard this, that they were pierced to their heart. And so they looked at Peter and they looked at the other disciples and they said, brothers, what should we do? They were faced with their own sin. They were faced with their own rebellion. They were cut to the heart and they said, what do we do? I'm going to face the judgment of God. What do I do? And Peter responded, repent. Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. That is the answer to judgment. To escape the judgment is repentance. Now we have to define that word repentance. It's kind of a biblical word. It's a church word that sometimes we don't quite understand what it means. Um, so in the Baptist Catechism, this was written hundreds of years ago, so forgive the archaic language. Uh, I like it, uh, but, but it, is kind of, it takes a little bit of time to read and let it sink in. But the Catechism, it asks a question, and then it gives us an answer for the use of training and teaching. So in the Baptist Catechism, it asks the question, what is repentance? And the answer is this, repentance is unto life is a saving grace by which a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and an understanding of the mercy of God in Christ does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it to God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. What is he saying? He's saying that whenever we see our sin, whenever we experience our sin, we hate it and we want to turn from it and we want to turn towards God. That's what repentance is. There's a book, in fact, I brought it with me in case you wanted to see it. It's The Doctrine of Repentance. It's by my favorite Puritan. His name is Thomas Watson. He's got a great name. Um, Doctrine of Repentance, this Puritan Thomas Watson goes through and he goes through the steps of repentance. So I thought it would be good as we focus in on how we escape judgment. We escape judgment through repentance and belief of Jesus. What does it actually look like to repent of our sins? And this is what Thomas Watson said. He said there are six steps. I combined uh, two and three into one because they're, they're similar in my mind, but these are the steps he said you go through in order to repent. The first step of repentance is that we need to see our sin, that we cannot repent of a sin that we are unaware of. So we have to see the sin. We have to see how it is against God's standards and against God's will, against his his call, and we have to then see that sin. One of the ways that we do this is by reading the word of God. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 7. He said, I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not know what it means to covet if the law had not said do not covet. One of the ways that we understand what sin is is by looking at the law of God, is by looking at the word of God. And as we look at the word of God, like a mirror, it shows us ourselves and it shows us where we fall short. It shows us our flaws. That's why one of our our values as a church is a value of the pulpit, is a value of the word of God, that we want to preach the word of God. We want to sing the word of God. We want to let the word of God direct us in confession and remind us of our pardon in Christ. It's one of the reasons why right now in the back table we have Bible reading plans out because we believe that the word of God is the only rule of faith in our lives. It's our only way that we can learn what it means to follow after God and to be obedient to God in life. I encourage you, if you're not in the word of God, begin to read. If you've not done a reading plan before, I encourage you to get the reading plan. It's called a five by five by five. It's uh, reading one chapter a day, spending five minutes uh, and asking five different questions of what you've read. 
I'd encourage you to start with that one. It'll take you through the whole New Testament in one year. After you've done that a few times and you feel ready, you might build up to reading the entire Bible in the whole year if you want to do that as well. But we need to read the Word of God because it shows us our sin. I think this is also another reason why we need to be in community. Because when we are in community, sometimes we can't see our own sin. Sometimes even in reading the Bible, we can't see our own sin. But when we are in a community of faith with other brothers and sisters in Christ, they can see our sin. And we need to be in a relationship with other people deep enough so that when they look at our lives and they see a sin, they can come to us with love and with gentleness and say, have you considered this verse? Now, if you are going to go to a brother or sister in Christ and, and talk about their sin and confront them with sin, guys, we, we do this tenderly. We do this gently. We go, I think, oftentimes with questions rather than accusations. And we try to help people see their sin in that way. Because this is also a place that can cause division and hurt and pain. Now, if someone comes to you and you feel that, that anger rise up in you, one of the things we need to do is to give our brother or sister like the benefit of the doubt and thinking they've just done a bold thing in coming to me and showing me what they think is one of my sins. And I need to view that as an act of love on their behalf and not an act of, of, of malice on their, on their behalf as well. So let's see our sin. Repentance begins with seeing our sin. Secondly, Thomas Watson says that the next step of repentance is sorrow for sin and shame for sin. That sorrow is grief, that when we see our sin, we are actually grieved by it. We see the brokenness of it. We see the corruption of it. We realize that we have harmed other people with our sin, that we have sinned against God with our sin. And there is a sadness that is tied to that. But not only is there sorrow, but Thomas Watson said there should also be shame for our sin. And this is kind of one of those things I was reading. I was reading the book this week and refreshing myself with it. I said, man, do I want to include this one? that we should feel shame for our sin. Because even when we say that word shame, it almost has this bad connotation. And I think one of the reasons why it has a bad connotation is because shame is oftentimes put on other people by others. And that's not what I'm talking about here. We don't give shame to other people. We don't put people underneath shame. But we should have shame in our own hearts when we realize what we have done against God. Thomas Watson calls shame, well, he calls blushing the color of virtue. So what is shame? Shame is a, a distress. Shame is a, a humiliation of what we have done by our actions and we, and we feel the weight of that. Part of repentance is sorrow and shame. And I think it's important to say when we're discussing shame that those shame of sin might cause us to bow our heads. It is the grace of God that lifts our head back up, that we don't live a life in shame, but it is a process and part of the process of us being lifted up out of it by God's grace, by God's kindness. So we see our sin we have sorrow and shame for our sin. Next, Thomas Watson says that we need to confess our sin. We confess our sin to God. We confess our sins to our brothers and sisters. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to make sure we are being specific in our confession. That we are not just dropping these general categories out there. But we're specific in our confession to God. And I'd also say, say this. I think it's important for us to confess our sin before our sin is revealed. And it's important to confess our sin before there is a consequence for our sin. 
One of the things that we need to be sorrowful for is the sin itself and not the results of that sin. I've seen it where, where people have fallen into sin on different occasions and they confess their sin. One person confesses their sin and shows sorrow for their sin after their sin is revealed. The other person confesses their sin and shows sorrow for their sin before it's revealed. One is much better than the other. One is more true. One is more pure than the other. To confess it, to show sorrow and grief for it before it is revealed. So be specific and do it quickly. James chapter 5 verse 16 tells us that not only do we confess our sins to God, but we confess it to one another. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Then in verse 19, he says this, My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. You see what's happening here? There's this idea that confession is tied to a turning away from our sins. And there's this idea in James chapter 5 that these two things don't just happen in our personal, private life of religion, but it happens within a community of faith. So we see our sin, we have sorrow for it, we have shame for it, we confess it. And then Thomas Watson says we need to have a hatred of our sin. He says that Christ is never loved until our sin be loathed. That repentance begins in the love of God and ends in the hatred of sin. Did you catch that? That repentance begins in the love of God and ends in the hatred of our sin. Do you hate the sin that's in your life? Do you despise it and does it make you just feel wretched against it and say, I don't want it in my life anymore. And I'm grieved by it and I'm experiencing sorrow because of it and shame for it. What, what Thomas Watson and what scripture says is that we need to hate sin and we need to fight against it in our lives. Now scripture tells us that when we believe in Christ, that he has set us free from those sins. And so the Christian life is this process of learning to love and obey Jesus. The Christian life is a process of fighting this sin that Christ has already delivered us from. So I think one of the things that we need to do is while we are fighting that sin, put up some, some very practical barricades against the sin that you're struggling with. We always use the example of, of like a purity of sight, purity of eyes, of, 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 of just trying to be people who are, who are pure in our, of what we look at, right? So we use that example. And so if that is your sin, if that is your struggle, you might say, well, I know I struggle with that when, when I'm alone. And so when I start feeling that temptation when I'm alone, I'm going to call my brother or sister in Christ. Or you might say, um, I know that that I struggle with that sin on these particular devices I have in my life. Well, brother and sister in Christ, like, why hold on to that device? And you might say, well, I need it for work or it's just so practical. And what I find is sometimes we love our technology more than we hate our sin. And what scripture is calling us to do is to hate our sins so much that we want to be cut off from it. What are you willing to do to say, I don't want my sin anymore. I hate it that much. And hatred to sin turns into turning from our sin, that we turn from our sin and we turn to Christ. And as we are in his word and as we are walking with the spirit, what we will find is that this life of learning to love and obey Christ begins to turn in that we have the same mindset of Christ, that we have the same, the same walk as Christ, and we are transformed 
into his image. We walk in his ways when we begin to resist and fight the ways of our desires that are against Christ. This is what Thomas Watson said repentance looks like. It's much more than saying, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. But it is a deep fight that includes our actions, our emotions, our thoughts. And I would say if we are only going to make one resolution this year, what would it look like for you to say, I'm going to make the resolution to repent? That this year, I am going to spend this year seeking sin in my life so that I can see it, so I can have sorrow over it, so that I can confess it and hate it and fight against it. And I'm going to do that time after time after time. Because I want to turn from that way of life and I want to turn towards Christ. The final question that we want to talk about today is this idea is what is the character and nature of our judge? We see that in verses 6, 7, 8, and 9 when Jesus tells this parable of a man who planted a fig tree in his vineyard. And this man let the fig tree grow to maturity. This takes about three years. And then on the fourth year, the vineyard owner comes to the fig tree expecting to see it laden with fruit, heavy branches, and finds nothing. So he goes back a second year to the same fig tree expecting to find fruit. I gave it an extra year to mature. Maybe the second year it will give fruit. But once again, there is no fruit and he comes back a third time and in frustration sees that there's no fruit on the fig tree he looks to his gardener the the man who's working his vineyard and he says there's no fruit on this tree it's fruitless and it's just sucking up all the other nutrients in the ground we should just cut this thing down to help all the other plants out in in my vineyard and the gardener looks to the vineyard owner and says this. He says, why don't we wait one more year? I'll dig around the roots. I'll put fertilizer on it. And maybe, maybe this next year it will bring fruit. But if not, we can cut it down. We can throw it into the fire and destroy it. When we look at this parable, what Jesus is doing is he is describing the character of our judge. And in this parable, both the vineyard owner and the vineyard gardener are pictures of our God. That like the vineyard owner, our God has expectations and standards. He has a rule of life that he has given us to live out and to follow. That he expects fruitfulness out of his children. But God is also like the gardener who is patient and kind and doing the work to create that fruitfulness. It's a picture of God saying, all day long I've held out my hands to a rebellious generation. Or it's a picture of God in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that says that God is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but all people to come to repentance. Earlier we said that repentance begins with the love of God and ends with the hatred of our sin. And what we see in this parable is a picture of that God that deserves so much love. I want you to think about one other thing about the character of God, and we'll close. We were talking about the super bloom earlier. That one of the reasons why a super bloom happens after a fire is because when the fire destroys the plants of the ground, it releases all the seeds. And those seeds then go into the ground and are able to flourish. But for all that flourishing to happen, there was seeds and there were plants that had to die to make that happen. So as we think about the character and nature of our God who has standards but is also patient and kind, we have to realize what Christ has done for us. That Christ 
actually went through the fire himself in order to create the blooming in us. That Christ went through the judgment of God, that Christ faced the wrath of God so that we could repent and receive his righteousness and pass through that fire into his kingdom. Why do we repent? Why do we hate sin? We hate sin because every sin we commit was one more sin that was laid upon Christ on the cross. Realizing that he received the wrath of God for that sin so that we could have life. And when we think about the character and the nature of that God, what other response can we have? But to say, I want to fight my sin. I want to be in Christ. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who became sin for us that we might receive his righteousness. We thank you that he passed through the fire of judgment so that we could flourish and bloom. So Father, I pray now that we would walk in your spirit, that we could start seeing that renewal and that super bloom happen in our life even now. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. shall be
church, let's remain standing for our benediction. Remember this week that Christ became your sin, that you might be his righteousness. Therefore, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. You are dismissed.